event, the first ever DevOps Summit here at Cloud Expo. Um, it's going to be a very exciting program today. We've got some fantastic speakers. I'm going to kick it off today. Uh, oh, by the way, my name is Andy Mann. I am the Tech Conference Chair for the DevOps Summit 2014. I'm going to kick it off today by introducing someone who really set the agenda in development and automated testing. John Michelson was the uh, CTO and co-founder of a company called ITKO that established a whole new market in the space of service virtualization, being able to remove constraints from development to rapidly accelerate delivery of new applications. A core function in the DevOps space, this is rapidly becoming absolutely critical for a lot of people working on delivering new applications in the cloud, on premise, and more. John Michelson is now Chief Technology Officer of CA Technologies, a multinational leader in IT management and security software. So without further ado, I would like to, to welcome to the stage for the first ever DevOps Summit keynote, Mr. John Michelson. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Really appreciate the fact that you've given me a few minutes here to talk about uh, DevOps and what I consider uh, poorly named, but I don't have anything better, and I'd be glad to take suggestions at the end of our talk here, a new state of the art in how we build, test, and deliver applications. Because what I'll start with is just how interesting and how exciting it is to be in this space right now and how crushingly difficult it is to be in this space right now. And then I'll move on to what I think are the key ingredients or practices we really have to get better at as a discipline in order to really meet the challenges that we face. So first, Andy did say that I'm the CTO of CA. And just to make sure you guys have a, here's the one slide commercial, if you will. CA is at the center of a lot of large and small companies, application development, delivery, security, and operating uh, activities. We're, uh, we're a uh, an almost $5 billion company. We're everywhere in the world, and we do quite a bit. We're, as we say, in the center of so many activities. One of those clearly is the development, delivery, and operating of software. And um, one of my favorite quotes of the last several years is the Andreessen quote, software is eating the world. Uh, you know, what, it, what, it means to, what, is, what does it mean for software to be eating the world? Well, we have a take on that. And that take has to do with the notion that software is essentially being re uh, business is essentially being rewritten by software. If you think about major businesses today there's just really no other way to think about it except that software is rewriting the way those businesses operate, the way they think about their customers, their partners, their employees. There's really this notion that business is being rewritten by software. And here's some pretty good examples. If you're in the entertainment delivery industry, you're differentiating on software features. You're competing not on your cost basis or on your customer sat ratings anymore. You're now in a feature race, what you can put in your mobile device, or can, you, can I speak to my remote control instead of having to go type on a keyboard somewhere? The software that drives the consumer experience is more critical these days than the actual content they're delivering. They're charging you for the content, but they're differentiating on the software features. The automotive industry is clearly being rewritten by software. I happen to own a Tesla, number 44 of the Model S. I got a software update two weeks ago. It literally pops up, just like the Mac or just like our Windows machines, pops up, I've got an update to your software. Can I install it now or do you want me to do it overnight? And I don't want to pull off on the side of the road, so I do the overnight thing. When you do the software update, this particular one, very interesting. You know, we in the US, we don't drive many standard shift cars, right? I think it's only like 5 or 6% of us actually own a standard shift car. So Teslas, actually, uh, they're pure electric cars. They're, there's no revolution of the motor while the car is at stop, right? Which means if you take your foot off the brake, the car rolls backward or forward, depending on if you're on a hill, up or down. Makes sense, right? Well, most folks that aren't used to driving a standard shift transmission, they, they're not used to that. In a software update, Tesla changed the behavior of the car that if you're on an incline and you have the brake on and you take the brake off, it holds the brake until you press the accelerator. That was a software update. I didn't take the car in for service. They're not planning it for the 2020 model. That was a software update. That if, I, if my understanding of Tesla's software development is, is accurate, didn't start, but in February, March, 
So there's forum posts in February, there's development in March, and it shows up in my car in May. Software is definitely rewriting the business of automotive. And in insurance, it's clearly happening. This is, I'm not making this up, it happens to be true. I have two teenage kids and one of them had an accident over the weekend. That is the State Farm mobile application. And you literally describe the accident. You put icons on your screen, you describe all the conditions, you take pictures of the car, you describe the damage, and you literally sequence what happened when the accident occurred. It does all of the typical things you'd expect a web presence to do, right? You can look up your policy and your, uh, your pricing and all of that. Very interesting though, they understand that mobile device is with you when you have a claim. Not after you have a claim and you get back to your desk, when you have a claim. Software has rewritten the insurance industry for sure. Here's another final of the individual example, CVS Pharmacy. I, I really like this one because I was actually affected by this, my family was, a few years ago. You know there are around 2,000 deaths in the US every year simply related to improper delivery of prescriptions. What was put in the canister or what was taken by the patient was not what they expected and they died in the process. Software, specifically here in the running the supply chain of CVS, getting all the way to the consumer where they're literally looking at a picture on their phone and looking at the pill they're about to take. Is it the right one? Is it the exact, is it the right shape? Is it the right color? Does it have the right emblem on it? And all of the tracking that has to go in to make sure that that happened, they're putting a dent in that number. And it's fantastic and that's software rewriting how we deliver goods, in this case prescriptions. And it's true in everything, whether it's Netflix and Hulu disrupting the way that the entertainment industry is delivered to us or how we want to consume it. Bitcoin, Airbnb, others. It, in every case, right, software is absolutely rewriting. It, it's not just the apps. APIs are a big, important part, too. I thought I would make that point because I'm, I'm really talking about how are we building applications today. And we're certainly building them as mobile applications. But clearly, if we're going to participate in the ecosystem of others, we need our APIs to be very powerful, very robust, and very consistent. So just taking as an example FedEx, it's been very, it's very infrequently that I go to a FedEx app to cause a FedEx transaction. I usually go to some other e-commerce site or I leverage some other service that has embedded a relationship with FedEx. My FedEx options are not delivered to me by going to FedEx. You see my point, right? FedEx's success in the, in the modern world is predicated on their APIs being easy for, the, easy for their partners to access, consume, and leverage in their applications. APIs are how we get access to ecosystems we do not have to build and maintain ourselves. And that mobile presence. Uh, you know, I remember just a few years ago, there was, a, there was a fairly reasonable debate. Do we really have to build native mobile apps or can we just get away with HTML5? Well, so far, and even trending, we can't just get away with HTML5. We're, we're going to be building, and we're going to continue to be building, native mobile applications. Getting more difficult because devices are proliferating more, right? And more devices, and what I mean by that is this is getting intelligent, right? There are more and more devices for us to deal with, and yet our consumers require a native experience. The mobile web is not enough. And of course, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Pretty soon, we're not going to be thinking about I have a mobile app, I have a tablet that's a fat version of it, and then yes, I have to build a web presence. Pretty soon, we're gonna end up delivering code onto 30 different device types. And if we think that the IoT notion is a consumer thing, realize that every single enterprise technology, almost every, starts in the consumer realm and moves there. It always starts in the consumer realm. The first colored uh, PC monitors you can go back to PC Magazine and in, in, the, uh, in the 80s, late 80s, and read the article that says, well, I don't know that businesses will ever need color, but for, if you're gonna play a game, it sure, it sure is nice to have four color graphics. And, and of course, I have a you know, 27 inch 1920 by 1080 screen with billions of colors on my desktop. So it's just a matter of time. Here's a video we presented that- What ha happens when a thing becomes more than a thing? Has to do with this. For instance, this phone is not a phone anymore. It's information, connection, commerce. It's 82 billion apps downloaded each year. It's billions of people and systems and things 
is the future of everything. This isn't a phone anymore. It's your business, and it's being rewritten by software. for right. <laughs> you want an odd line in a song. Okay, so I think I made the case that I think I didn't have to, right? We could have all checked the box on the way in that we know that it's an app economy, it's an API economy, and the expectations are obscene on us to build, deliver, and operate software in a way that we never have before. And it's even an exponential growth, right? We think linearly as, as humans, but we actually are on exponential curve in growth. But what does that actually mean for us now as we transition to how are we going to do this well? Because you, you don't have to go far to see catastrophic failure in our ability to actually keep up with this. You, could, you can try to simplify this down to what we typically do, especially for our larger customers, in literally many, many months. We now have the expectation to do in weeks, really days or hours. And in order to accomplish that, we have to have a whole new way of thinking. Because what we did in the past to get to the success we have now is clearly not going to work for us to have success in the future. If we're talking about months to hours, but just think about it this way. One of our larger banking customers says, just to status a project, I spend three days with my product manage project management office building a PowerPoint that I can present. Today, projects take three days long. You can't have a three-day process to status a project, right? So we're, diff we're talking about a whole different level of speed. And yet, this is what most of us are staring at. Like, make that go fast. Make that always work. Make that scale in any direction. Go figure out how to make this change right now. Oh, don't break anything. And do that in hours. OK, all right, it's, it's Tuesday. You got to Friday. It literally is a completely different way of thinking about it. And let's be honest, my favorite analogy, unfortunately, for how most software development projects I see feel so much like this. These attempts at early flight, right? I mean, look, let's, let's put this in context. These aren't idiots. These are the smart guys who thought they had the right idea, who really did think that there was going to be liftoff here. Look at this poor guy. And I love this. Watch him. Watch him. He's like nudging in a minute. You'll see. Some of this stuff makes you wonder, doesn't it? But tell me you don't feel like you're in the middle of a software delivery cycle and feeling just like these guys at some point, right? It just doesn't fly. That's airmail right there. That's, that was the label, airmail. Okay, there's the, this is the most courageous guy in the video, right here. <laughs> Are we not dealing with, oh, here, this is great. Get to a certain air temperature, or, or excuse me, uh, uh, height. Oh, wings don't work, bang. It doesn't take going all that far back in history. This is a slide from McKinsey's report on healthcare.gov. Healthcare it's actually about a year ago they produced this. This is pre-production uh, or non-production that happened last October. Look at what it says. Uh, the ideal condition is you have clear articulation of requirements and success metrics. How many of us have clear 
How many of us get? How many of us have that? Oh, adequate time for long, long periods of time, adequate time for integrated system testing, right? Long periods of time, no big rollout, let's roll out just a little bit and see if it worked and then we'll, if that's, the, if that's the presumption in order for us to get this right, we will never get it right because we never have those things, do we? So we're going to have to accomplish that hours to possibly days delivery of interesting things and do so with, without the things we know it's gonna, that we really want in order to get it done. In fact, this might be the most difficult slide in terms of establishing the how challenged we are. This drives me nuts. 25% of our users will abandon a web page after three seconds of load time. I experienced this myself. My, my, uh, my son turned 16. I told him if he kept his grades up, he was gonna get a truck. He really wants to buy a Ford, Chevy, Dodge pickup. He, uh, he knew that he could design the truck online, right? He could paint it, put the wheels on it, and do all that stuff. So we literally go to the Dodge site. We go to the configurator. I, I am not kidding. You couldn't count to three before he said, Ford has one, right? He closed the browser, he relaunched the browser, and he went looking for Ford's site. Dodge had three seconds. He owns an F-150. Dodge had three seconds to get his imagination about what that truck was gonna be and they literally lost it. 80 to 90% of our users on our mobile apps, if they, don't, if they don't get the experience they're looking for the first time, they're not going to come back. They're going to delete that app and try the, the next one in the search results. And if that one delivers, you've just lost a customer. It's that significant. And what was production defects when I first started development, you know what production defects were back then? Go back to paper, right? Oh, it's not working, go back to paper. Or Sally, write this sticky note on, on, on a, on a post-it, put it on your computer, that whenever that happens, hit Control, Alt, Delete, and tell the customer you're looking that up for them, right? That's not the case anymore. This is now a millions, even billions of dollars of cost. Your business stops working, your customers go away. So DevOps. DevOps is a very critical aspect of how we need to make this work. I wanna transition now to what we're gonna do about it. When you think about how we do application development, test, and release these days, we get very little touch time. This is a manufacturing analogy, and in fact, DevOps itself really lends itself to, un and to really rationalizing, wait a minute, other engineered goods have been getting better and better. How can we borrow concepts from those other engineering disciplines and apply them to software? DevOps is essentially the integration of all the disciplines of building software together, not serialized and sub-optimized for each activity, but instead integrated with one optimization goal, which is the faster, more efficient delivery of the completed unit. The classic example in manufacturing is when you sub-optimize, you end up with a warehouse full of spare parts, but no more product at the end, right? So you need to integrate the disciplines horizontally instead of have the wall, the classic stove pipe, and the classic throwing the code over the wall kind of thing. So we need to increase the touch time and reduce the idle time, using manufacturing analogy. And DevOps is an approach that allows us to get ourselves wrapped around that concept. When all of the constituents, and by the way, it's not just dev test ops, it's security, it's the business analysts who drive requirements or the product owners, it's everybody who has to really participate in this because the only way to optimize the throughput is to take into account every step along the way and make sure that they all participate in the optimal way possible. Now I'm gonna break a couple of rules here. First, never put a uh, slide up in front of a large audience with a bunch of text on it. I just broke that one. The second one, don't spend a whole lot of time on any one slide. I'm about to break both of those. Because I really think that this embodies that new thinking it's gonna take for us to really get good at this. And I, I'll spare you the reading every bullet here. But let me just spend a couple of minutes on, I don't know, reading the Riot Act to each of the main disciplines involved as we think about DevOps. When you think about the developers, the testers, and the operations folks, the developers are going to have to understand they're building a component of a composite. Developers, for most of our careers, we have not really thought about building a component at a time and making sure that individual component works. We thought about writing a whole bunch of code, our other team's building a bunch of code, we'll assemble it and see if we can get it to work. That is a non-starter. 
That's why our project timelines run way too long and why we have so many unexpected defects late in a cycle. We have to think more the way that hardware guys do. Do you think that it would work to get computers built efficiently if Intel built a CPU, handed it to Dell, and said, figure out if it works for me? Build a motherboard, plug it in, tell me if it boots. You realize Dell makes the assumption the CPU works. If you go to integration test, do you actually assume your stuff is going to work? No. In fact, you get functional defects in the components, and you don't even learn of them until integration test time. That's got to stop. And unit testing is a good shot, is, a, is at least awareness of the problem, but most unit testing is actually, did I construct the code the way I intended, not acceptance type testing. We've got to understand, you've got to build legitimate components. In order to do that, we've got to leverage simulation technology, the same way that the Intel chip is lever leveraging simulation technology, the same way that modern aviation does to avoid all those crashes. We've got to recognize interface boundaries a whole lot more We've got to get really good at building components of a composite. We all giggled when we saw that screen a few minutes ago about the huge whiteboard. You've got to recognize each of those components need to be built in its own discrete way. Quality engineering. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that if we did a survey, an honest survey, most every one of us would have one or two good examples of where we focused on automating the validations whether that's functional testing, performance engineering, security, vulnerability, all these things. So every one of us probably has a, one or two good examples where we did a decent job of it, but if you gave yourselves a grade overall, you'd have a woefully inadequate level of automated test. You take weeks and weeks of manual labor to do validation, and yet we're moving to a continuous delivery type of, of expectation where we're making multiple drops to production a day. So clearly this doesn't work, right? Clearly, quality engineering is an engineering discipline. You have to engineer in quality. Machines do the testing. You do the engineering of the test. And as an industry, we have really failed at this. Even, by the way, I now sit on the problem side of this. The software vendors who build those test engines have done a pretty poor job, I think, in the past, where we've superficially tried to test only at user interface levels which doesn't really help, right? That whiteboard, most of the, of, the, uh, of the emblems on that whiteboard were actually headless, aren't they? They're API based, they're messaging based, they're backend systems, et cetera. Oh, this one's, let me highlight this one. Over-reliance, because I get a lot of questions on this. Over-reliance on end-to-end -end systems is a lack of discipline. That gets to the componentization thing again. If you need an end-to-end -end environment to test your component, you're not doing your work in the component development and test world. That's the point. When we heard from the healthcare.gov folks that every one, of, every one of those vendors walked up in front of Congress and said, we couldn't do our testing because we didn't have a sufficient end-to-end -end test environment. That's them being Intel and saying, hey, Dell, do my testing. That's what that was. We've got to make sure our stuff works before it ever gets to assembly. And by the way, how can every assembled part just start testing all together and not just be chaos, right? So we really won't get there without that. Operations. You know, um, if you, in the past, this needs to change. In the past, if you wanted to be the hero and you wanted to get a bonus in operations, you were the hero who prevented a bad release from going to production, right? Like, I'm the guy that found the security vulnerability. I'm the one who realized the configuration was wrong. I'm the guy who, at the 11th hour, figured it out, and I stopped it. And we would champion those folks. He saved us. He protected us from those fools upstream and dev or test. That guy needs to be fired today because that's not DevOps. That's the antithesis of DevOps. The ops guy's job is to ensure the delivery of applications fast and on time, not to stop applications from releasing by discovering something so late that no one can react in time and we have to stop the process. It's a huge shift in mindset. Ops has got to inline in order to discover real time in order to remediate in time. Does that make sense? We've got to stop the at the end I own, my piece is, you go do all your work, you think you get it right, and then I'll find out what's wrong. That is not the right ops mindset. When ops realizes that they've got to real-time identify so we can remediate in time, then we're really operating with the right thinking, and that's when DevOps will really deliver on its promise. 
so there are some practices that I want to try to introduce you guys to. Um, with the, you know, about 10 minutes I have remaining, that's probably enough time. And I'm breaking now the third rule, by the way. There are three rules. Not too much text on a slide, oops. Spend a lot of time on that slide, oops. And here's the third one. Introduce way too much material than you could possibly completely cover. There you go. I got all three. But I, at least let's introduce some concepts to you. And then maybe as you look, as you, uh, as you go to some of the sessions afterwards, there are sessions on some of these topics. And as you follow up with, uh, with uh, folks like me and others, um, certainly we can, we can expand on this. Leveraging simulation and producer-consumer governance. If you don't like the G word, we'll use the word collaboration. I actually like governance. It keeps people from hitting me head on in traffic. It keeps them from hitting me while, I, while the light's green and theirs is red, but they don't care what that means. I sort of like governance, but, but I know we developers, we, we have this anti thing about governance. So pr producer-consumer collaboration. I'll talk about that for a minute. Second is automating every validation, testing, performance engineering security. Third is continuous delivery. We've got to, another automation activity, right? You've got to automate the delivery of every change. We cannot have people running around, building environments bespoke, promoting changes in that way. And then finally, we need really deep in instrumentation or monitoring and a feedback loop from operations context to development context. Those, I think, are the four practices, I think, that will really help us accelerate. So first, let me get to what I mean by simulation. You know, we don't build airplanes by fabricating wings, sticking them on planes, and seeing if a test pilot can get it to fly. Those guys in the video did, right? But that's not how we do it anymore. We use wind tunnels. Wind tunnels provide us with the ability to make sure that our design works in every temperature, every barometric pressure, every wind speed and direction, every condition that we need to make sure it works. And we do this to make it faster to build the wing. Most developers think it slows you down to do this, but in fact, if the goal is not to get through the dev step, but to actually deliver software, remember, that's what we have to do. We all have to own the same goal. Not hitting our code freeze date, but actually delivering software fast, then you realize that building very simplistic mocks or just getting a compile and then finding out later if it actually works in realistic conditions, that's not gonna cut it. We've got to leverage simulation technology that allows us to fully understand our component, make sure it works under every condition we expect before we ever put it in an assembly. What we call, is, what we call that is virtual services. The notion of I have a virtual service that represents the real thing before the real thing even exists, possibly. You know, the guys are building the fuselage. I've still got to build a wing in parallel. That sounds like our problem all the time, doesn't it? In fact, this is that producer-consumer governance thing. In reality, we're, we're no good at parallel development, where two teams are codependent on each other. But leveraging good simulation technology and good test validation, we can get really good at this. When I am going to build, I'm a consumer. I'll use that point of view for the moment. When I'm the consumer of a component that is going to change, and I need those changes, I'm going to build a virtual service of the current behavior of that of that system, so they don't have any constraints on the underlying system. I don't have to wait for the wind to speed to change. I don't have to wait for a real production system. The simulator of that system is completely under my control. I can even change its behavior. Per what the spec says, the new version of the component's gonna be at the end of the development cycle. I immediately write tests against that simulated thing. I test the thing I'm dependent on. I No, I'm not testing my code. I'm testing my expected behaviors of my dependencies. That's a really smart thing for me to do ident to identify whether my code's at fault or if the dependency has changed in some unexpected way. I give that test body to my, de to my uh, producer, the service that is supposed to be changing, because that embodies my expectations of their future behavior. Would be really good to know three months before I'm actually gonna see the real thing that my expectations are completely off of what they're gonna build, right? So immediately we start establishing much better expectations. As I do my development, completely free from, hey, your build broke. My guys can't code anymore. I can't do a compile because you just pulled the whatever out of your build. You eliminate all that stuff. And instead, I'm building in real time. They're building in real time. At any point, we can checkpoint. I can switch from, to, from my virtual service. I can point at the real thing. I always get the feedback loop that I need. But then when we hit integration test, it's going to work. 
because we've been in a live-like integration scenario already. My simulation is of the real thing, right? Does the wind know the difference between God blowing the wind and me blowing the wind with a fan? It doesn't. Our software doesn't either. Good simulation technology in the form of virtual services gives us that ability. Testing every validation. Um, you got to think about each and every component and assembly as something that needs to be instrumented for test. And it's not just barely functional testing so that we can hand it off to the team and wherever in order to, for them to do the real testing. We've got to understand that engineering, quality engineering, is about building all of those validations so that I can do it on demand. I've got to be able to do it three times a day, right? Leverage the scale and elastic capacity we have in cloud to go do this and be able to say, it's always got to be done in an hour. If it's 1,000 tests or 15,000 tests, it has to be done in an hour. And you can do that stuff today. So if we can get to the point where our validations are as fast as a build, and we can scale up the amount of capacity we need in order to get them done, we'll get there. Unless we do, as you look at most of your development cycles, test is the long pole. It's also the one that has the most people process involved. Oftentimes, you've even got to schedule them. We're never going to get to our pace and quality goals if that's the way we leverage test. It's got to be machine work. And of course, continuous delivery. In fact, if I didn't see the uh, presenters before me already today talking more about this and the fact that the show floor is full of great examples of continuous delivery, I'd spend more time on it. But let me just say, continuous delivery has to be a cornerstone of this. Again, let's borrow the manufacturing analogy. If we did not have a shop floor with a consistently running conveyor belt, you'd never get product built appropriately. But instead, we've got to have that system that builds that development environment and promotes every change from dev through all those test environments out into production. Equally important, this is really critical, we got to be able to roll back changes as effectively as we introduce changes. I love expect being on Optimist. I love it. It's too bad it just bites you in the you know where every once in a while, being one. If you build a system of one-way delivery that does not allow you to roll back, you've got a problem if you have an unexpected uh, uh, issue. So the ability to roll back, that's why I, I see a lot of our customers that write a lot of code and they think they're doing continuous delivery. Let me just say that you have to double that amount of code if you're going to roll back effectively, right? And that's a huge amount of engineering. No, not a single team I've seen has the labor effort to do that. So I'd suggest you make a system responsible for building those and building all of that, uh, what would otherwise be script. There are systems out there that can do continuous delivery for you. And then finally, I talked about monitoring in that feedback loop. So we all know we need to monitor our systems in production, right? The, the, the strangest notion that I see in my customer base is when I hear customers say, well, we don't want to spend so much on disk or, on, or the overhead, so we don't monitor this one very much, or we, only, we monitor this one a lot, we only monitor this one a little bit, and this one we sort of assume it's the problem if these other systems go down. It's like, wow, so we'll keep using the aviation analogy. Would you want me to be the Boeing guy that walks up to the, to the podium and God forbid a plane goes down, but if it, it you know, they do. Well, folks, we, we were going to save some disk space. We didn't really want to spend a whole lot of, you know, we didn't want the overhead. So we didn't put a bunch of systems in the black box. So we actually don't know why the plane went down. We're going to have to see a bunch more planes go down, and then maybe we'll start to guess a little bit better. But that's exactly what we do in software, isn't it? That's exactly what we do in software. So afford the disk, deal with the overhead, you can, right? Those are reason we can reasonably deal with those things. We can model for them and we can build for them, we can test for them. Instrumentation is cheap compared to the consequences of not doing it well. And once we have sufficient deep in instrumentation of what is really going on, we have a traumatic effect to, that we can bring back to bear in development. Here's just one simple example. Let me run this animation through a few steps. So let's say order management is a really important system to us. It takes an enormous amount of load. It's, we have to be very careful with the performance and scalability of it, right? Wouldn't it be great, as I do a new build of order management, to virtually put it in production at peak? Wouldn't I want to do that? You know what I do today? 
I got a couple hundred of users in my load test lab. I got some test systems that I run that uh, order management against, like my backend ERP system, my backend mainframe. They have a completely different performance profile of production, but that's what I got. So I run a few hundred users. I do a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an operation mix that one of the testers told me, is it production? Is that the real data scenarios and, and arrival rate of, of, of load? No, but I just do it. I do a certain amount of performance testing and then I say, okay, well, I mean to pass that. So we'll drop it into production and that's when it sees reality for the first time ever, right? That is the state, current state of the art in performance engineering. But if you use really good monitoring instrumentation and simulation through virtual services, et cetera, you get the ability to virtually put order management in production at peak by observing what happened in the past and bringing that into the performance lab. Run the exact same load pattern with the exact same operation mix with the exact same set of data scenarios that you observed in production. You know exactly what order management, the new build of order management is going to get in terms of its reliability, because not only are you doing that, but you're taking the backend systems and stabilizing them to make them respond just the same way that production does, the same network latency, the same response times, et cetera. So instead of having a do a bunch of activities and hope it was enough, you can literally say this new build of, of order management would or would not have satisfied last time we observed peak utilization of order management in production. It's an absolute yes or no, isn't it? And of course, you can model all of the variation you think you'll have. Now that we have a new build of order management, we think we'll get 20% more of this. Or what if we want a performance test at this level instead? Or what if our ERP system slows down? You get to model all of those things as well, instead of just whatever the existing test system can do for you. Modeling and simulation, incredibly important for us to get right as a part of the new state of the art. So this is incredibly geeky, but I like it. Today, more organizations are running I mean. DevOps practices to deliver software faster than ever before. Running a successful DevOps practice requires the right mix of culture, tools, collaboration, and automation. It's kind of like running a modern factory. Inside the factory, successful software delivery starts with planning and analysis to ensure the best ideas align with business needs. Only then do budgets get approved and the product lines start moving. Out on the floor, product managers collaborate with their teams to ensure work stays aligned with business needs and to verify that the right features are delivered out the door. Using powerful automation tools, DevOps teams work in parallel to create, test, and deliver software. To accelerate this work, they simulate production environments with service virtualization while still in development and testing. As multiple Agile sprints converge, new features and changes are fused into a single build. Release and test automation allows builds to get picked up and moved quickly through the delivery process. When builds move into pre-production testing, DevOps teams use service virtualization to replicate production data and services. This makes it possible to test against legacy infrastructure, third-party APIs, and other critical dependencies, allowing them to catch issues before they hit production. If an issue is identified, DevOps teams use integrated communication tools to connect the right people with key information that will allow them to fix the issue swiftly. As builds move through testing, changes in the production environment automatically update testing suites. Once the build is ready and the release is authorized, ops teams monitor its application performance and the infrastructure that runs the application. And when production issues happen, ops teams are able to recognize these issues and take appropriate action to resolve them. Empowered with the ability to deploy multiple times per day, organizations can provide continuous delivery, meet the demands of business, and surpass the competition. CA DevOps solutions for a better business outcome. So I appreciate your time. It's, uh, it's great to uh, be in the inaugural uh, DevOps Summit. This is, uh, this is a great time for us. Again, it's a fantastic time to be in this line of work. When I was uh, 15 and I decided I wanted to write code, um, I thought, wow, for only $5,000 I can buy a, an IBM PC and I can start to write code on DOS and look at all of the commands that are available to me in, in, my, in uh, GW Basic. Today, 
the, um, the amazing amount of compute power and APIs provided to me just before I even get started, right? So we're in an amazing time, but the expectations have grown, out, have grown amazing as well. I encourage you to take a look at our booth um, and certainly the rest of the show floor. Many of the summits or are, uh, are track sessions are going to talk about some of these concepts that I've introduced here. And I hope you have a fantastic time here at our show. Thanks.